Hello, wanderers of the internet, it's Paleo Jonathan, and welcome back to Minecraft Dinosaurs, or that's what I would say, were there not a couple of major changes that make that a little bit more difficult. Obviously, the primary one being uh, I grew out my hair. Not really, you know, there are bigger fish to fry. Uh, most of all being this uh, pile of rubble over here with a ever-burning flames and permanently leaking radioactive green liquid. If I were that squid, I'd get far away from that. Or maybe it'll turn into a kraken. Could be bad, could be good, we'll see. Uh, you know, but mostly it's something that I want to stay uh, far away from. In fact, oh gosh, there he... There he goes. <laughs> yeah, so I'll be staying uh, firmly on the other side of this river. Uh, and... You know, it's bad enough to have a crash time machine, barely survive, swim across the river. Uh, it's bad enough that I landed in this absolutely alien wasteland. I mean, yeah, it's kind of similar, but I mean, look at how ugly it is. Look at all this lighting. It's disgusting. Uh, and, I mean, at least there's some there's some cool plants. Hemp. <laughs> uh, but uh, the bigger issue is that I'm not quite certain when I was, uh, when I was back in the future or past, depending, uh, when was Minecraft Dinosaurs, uh, about a year ago, actually, but, uh, when was I when I was making that? It's confusing all around. Uh, one thing has stayed the same, though, in both times, is that, uh, the locals have been equally useless in both cases. However, uh, scrapping together some material I got from them alongside more typical uh, resource gathering. I've managed to get back on my feet. You know, it's been a lovely camping trip. Uh, I, I've got a tent. I've got I've got a campfire. I cook meat on it. Uh, I, I miss my dinosaurs and stuff. But I mean, you know, don't we all? You know, it's been a year and all. So, um, I the first thing I did was construct a time machine of a form totally not derivative, totally original. You've never seen one shaped like that before. And, uh, while well, it's, you know, mostly under construction, still experimental, and probably just as dangerous as the one over there. Frankly, I'm desperate, and, uh, this is, uh, just about the only path I have. So, to figure out when I was, and where I need to go, or when I need to go, I suppose, I've made that joke so many times, you'd think I'd get it straight in my head by now, I'm going to be doing a comprehensive study of just about every time on Earth. You know, going through all the uh, history of life, the history of the formation of Earth, and hopefully uh, you know, being a bit educational more than the norm. You know, not at all related to me applying to colleges and needing to look a little bit better for them. So, uh, <laughs> that's what I'll be doing. And uh, it's totally not at all an excuse to figure out where I was by guess and checking, because Goodness knows that would be impossible. In fact, it would mean that the world would be almost entirely lost, and we don't want that, do we? So, uh, you know, we'll cope like that. That's how it'll be. The first trip will be back as far as I dare to go, to the Hadean Eon. Eons are the largest groupings of time in geologic history, with there being four of them. The Hadean the first, lasting from the formation of the Earth roughly 4.5 billion years ago, until 4 billion years ago. To put that in perspective, almost all the recognizable, complex, macroscopic, meaning you can see it, uh, life that you may be aware of, lived within the current Phanerozoic Eon, which only goes about half a billion years back to the Cambrian. The Earth in the eons preceding the Phanerozoic would have been virtually alien and completely inhospitable for nearly their entirety. For today's trip, I'll need to wear an oxygen mask in order to even be able to breathe. And I'll have to take immense caution not to die from heat, or worse. Shaders have even yet to be invented in not just the Hadean, but the Precambrian as a whole, due to performance restrictions and uh, custom atmospheres, you know. Uh, with that lovely information, I believe it's about time. <laughs> Get it? I hop into the totally original, completely unique in design time machine and get going. <laughs> nah, the, the seat is purely decorative, as is everything else except for the portal, as you might have been able to guess. Uh, well, I suppose in I go. 
Well, I'll be. The machine seems to have worked against all odds. Uh, in fact, my atoms feel far more put together than they did last time. Uh, that all being said, this beautiful vista before you is the Hadean Eon. Even at the 4.2 billion years I traveled back, hundreds of millions of years since the formation of the Earth, it's still entirely inhospitable. Heat remaining from the formation of the planet, as well as repeated impacts, have caused Earth's surface to remain partially molten leading to the absolutely hellish landscape before you. It's no wonder it was named after Hades, Greek god of the underworld. It's blisteringly hot even standing far away from the lava. But in fact, by most very rough estimations, this is shockingly cold for the Hadean, a rare moment in which I can survive on the surface without some form of essentially spacesuit. Oh, there's some zircon up here too. I spotted plenty down there, but uh, you know, it's a little dangerous in the giant field of lava and magma. I think this one is perfectly fine as a teaching tool. So, uh, zircon is a mineral, but what's notable is that it's incredibly strong and resilient. Billions and billions of years from now, it'll be the oldest material remaining on the surface of the Earth, the only rock from the Hadean accessible to humans. Most of what we know about the Hadean Earth comes from intense research into clues found within Zircon just like this right here. In fact, it wouldn't be half bad an idea to take this as a sample, given I uh, don't want to get too close to all the other ones over there. Anywho, I need to get walking, taking care to stay uh, far away from that lava. Don't quite intend to get burnt. But, uh, there's a few things out here I intend to show. And, uh, you know, the oxygen is only going down. As Luigi iconically proclaimed in the episode of Mama Luigi, It's a lava waterfall! I mean, frankly, you really know it's a, a beautiful day when you're watching the sun set onto a actual, literal, lake of lava. You know, like it is on Earth. You know, very normal planet, very safe planet. Everything's awful! Ah! Sorry, I've gotten a hold of myself. I mean, it's still mostly pretty and not existentially terrifying. You know, it's not, not that bad. While I walk, I reckon I should give a brief overview of how the Earth was formed. Before there was anything we recognize today, there was a solar nebula a giant cloud of dust and gas in space. It spun quite fast, rotating around and flattening into a disk. In time, the vast majority of the material would combine in the center, sparking fusion and creating a new star, our sun. From the leftover materials, the rest of the solar system formed, including our Earth. As it formed, the Earth was incredibly hot, an immense amount of energy as the planet crushed itself into being. The surface would be nearly entirely molten. There was no atmosphere, no oceans, no continents, nothing but a ball of molten rock. In time, of course, stuff started cooling down on the surface, and Earth would start to stratify, dense materials sinking into a boiling hot core, and lighter stuff rising up to the surface. The crust would form from that and its first activity would start as volcanoes shot melting material right beneath the surface into the air. Gases from these eruptions, alongside possibly vaporization from a major impact I'll get to later, would form Earth's first stable atmosphere, heavy, hot, and completely devoid of oxygen, hence my need for the mask. That's what the point of the mask is. Get it? <laughs> uh, aside from that, though, uh, it wouldn't be until life began to photosynthesize that oxygen would finally reach the atmosphere, and it would be long after that that it became sustainable. Right about here, however, is exactly what I was searching for, a field of craters from an impact. While the exact specifications vary, at the very least it's certain that during the Hadean, the rate of meteor and asteroid impacts would have been much, much higher. New materials would have been brought to Earth, and it would have kept it hot and molten. Perhaps most interesting, however, is its possible relation to the origin of life on Earth. While it's certainly not commonly accepted and does little to explain life in the universe as a whole, it's not entirely impossible that life is transmitted throughout the universe by way of meteor impacts. 
life on Earth could have originated from some far-off place, or even another planet within the solar system. There is little direct evidence, of course, but it's interesting to think about, and I'd be remiss not to mention it. Much more commonly accepted, however, is a link between a gigantic impact and the moon. It's most likely that the largest, most cataclysmic and destructive disaster in the history of the Earth is in fact what gave us the moon. It's theorized that early in the Hadean, about four and a half billion years ago, a mere few million after the solar system formed at all, a planet the size of Mars, hypothetically named Thea, collided with the Earth. Material was shot up into a ring orbiting the planet, comprised of rock from both Earth and Thea, and eventually it coalesced into the moon, although it looked entirely unlike the moon we see today. Near its formation, it would have appeared to rotate from Earth, although it wouldn't be long until it became tidally locked. This occurred when the time to rotate on its axis and to revolve around the Earth became almost exactly the same, leaving the same side of the moon to point towards Earth at all times. Even now, in this point of the Hadean, it still appears much larger than it does in the present day. However, in reality, it's just a lot closer. A slight red glow still remains from its formation, as it cools, much like the Earth. Many of the craters that will eventually remain on the inert moon have already formed, although many are yet to come. Most of those craters would form during an event in the very late Hadean, uh, just a little bit later, relatively speaking, from where we are now, and it's in fact the reason I went further back than the very end of the Hadean. This is called the Late Heavy Bombardment. Evidence is inconclusive at best, but it's almost certain that 4.1 billion years ago, or about 100 million years forward in time from where I am now, a huge amount of asteroids and comets will hit the Earth and Moon, redefining the surface of both. It's hard to say with much confidence, and I certainly don't intend to travel to that time to investigate any time, <laughs> get it? <laughs> uh, any time soon. Uh. <laughs> now that we've covered the origin of Earth, the obvious follow-up questions pertain to how it developed from there. Where are oceans? When did continents start to form through plate tectonics? Well, to start, there was certainly water. Much of it was trapped inside the Earth at its formation, and it would be shot into the atmosphere by volcanic eruptions. More still would come from comets as they battered the early Earth. Estimates of how much water, when it reached the atmosphere, and when it became cool enough to condensate into oceans vary wildly. Some going as far to suggest that the Earth may have been entirely covered with water and cooled during part of the Hadean. The fact that I am able to survive here without dying from heat implies it likely is cool enough for oceans in some places, although I certainly don't have the oxygen or bravery to travel in search of them. In terms of proper continents, continental crust, and plate tectonics, the question is even more complicated. While a hotter, more viscous molten core of Earth would have led to incredibly intense convection, or rising and falling of rocks, it's hard to say what this would have looked like on the surface. It could have powered incredibly active plate tectonics, but it's hard to say. You know, we just don't have rocks from the Hadean to figure that out. Furthermore, it's possible that early oceans would have kick-started plate tectonics, and, uh, we already aren't certain about those either. Some of the few zircon crystals that remain from the Hadean may suggest that plate tectonics were occurring on the surface far earlier than we previously imagined, and that, likewise, the oceans also formed rather early. It's very possible that the vast majority of Hadean Earth became quote-unquote normal very early on, as hard, as hard as it is to believe in this desolate wasteland. At the very least, it's likely that once the late heavy bombardment ended, a more typical oceanic Earth with large continents soon followed. Here we arrive at the last stop on my brief tour of the Hadean. We stand before a pool of boiling sulfuric acid, not entirely unlike acidic hot springs today. And just like the hot springs today, it positively reeks of rotting egg, or perhaps more properly, rotting eggs reek of sulfur. These disgusting mires of, uh, primordial soup, as many call it, hold the building blocks of the very thing I've deliberately gone without mentioning, life. The potential for life in the Hadean is very new to scientists, and there's little proof, but our friends the zircon crystals may yet have one more major secret to share. If you've taken biology or chemistry, you'd be aware that life is formed based on the element of carbon, primarily. 
What's unique about carbon in life, or biogenic carbon, is the frequency of different isotopes. Carbon-13 has an extra neutron, and is thus heavier than carbon-12. As such, biological material prefers carbon-12, typically, and it occurs slightly more often than the normal distribution. Inside one of the few zircon crystals from the late Hadean, 4.1 billion years old, is a small chunk of graphite, which just so happens to have a frequency of carbon-12 that may possibly suggest the presence of life. Whether it was in hydrothermal vents under the more traditional interpretation, or in hot springs much like this pool under the novel hot spring hypothesis, it's very possible that even in the hellish conditions of the Hadean, that life managed to uh, find a way. And it first sprang up through abiogenesis all the way back in the very first eon of Earth. Well, I'll describe the process more in detail once I'm absolutely certain we're looking at an example of it. Abiogenesis was and I just about got hit by a meteor. G goodness gracious. I'll take that as my cue to get the heck out of here. I, I suppose that's what I get for standing in a field full of craters and lecturing instead of just like showing you it and then going back to safety to show you. you know, honestly, I make dumb decisions. I wouldn't be here if I was smart. Well, at the very least, the time machine is still in one piece. Perhaps I should have put a bit more effort into protecting it, or maybe I shouldn't have built it out of wood. Well, all's well that ends well, and I gotta get the heck out of here! And with that, I'm back! Uh, back in the same time, same place, with minor, you know, temporal and locational uh, accounting on the fact that I don't want to, like, you know, land on top of the exact moment I entered, and, you know, at minimum, having an uncomfortably close moment, and at worst, you know, end-of-the-world explosion type stuff. Hard to tell. Really, I, uh, am not qualified to be doing this, but, uh, you know, frankly, no need to worry about that when the trip was successful. You know, I made it back in, uh, one piece, back here, and, uh, yeah, that's the, uh, end of the trip, and the end of the Hadean, because there is no way you'll ever catch me going back there. Next time, we'll be going to, uh, the Archean, and it's altogether a lot more tolerable. In fact, uh, it's the very start of Earth being tolerable. Well, uh, I don't want to get too ahead of myself. You'll just have to come back and watch, I suppose. That's right. Come on, watch, like, and subscribe, YouTube video. Ah, thanks for watching. Woo! Gotta have the high-energy outro, you know, it's been a while. I gotta force it these days. <laughs> oh, well, see ya.